Hey John and Hank, it's Tuesday here in Delhi, India. Let me introduce you to my viewers who are primarily Indian. Surfing Violinist fans, if you're not already familiar with John and Hank Green, the vlog brothers, please do check out all their videos. I've got a link to a video here that's discussing Catherine Boo's book, Behind the Beautiful Forevers, which is about life in a slum in Mumbai. Probably draw comparisons in your mind at first to Slumdog Millionaire, but it's closer to Salam Bombay, Mira Nair's superior film way back from the early 80s. So I do recommend this book. Right now, John is discussing it. He's discussed up through chapter four in this particular video here, so check it out. I'd really like to get an Indian perspective on this book. I'm gonna throw in my two cents of what I've read so far. Here are three observations. Number one, the butterfly effect. As Jeff Goldblum's Ian Malcolm says in Jurassic Park, describing chaos theory, a butterfly could flap its wings in Peking and in Central Park you get rain instead of sunshine. You could almost say that about our world economic interconnectedness. While it may be tempting to say that Behind the Beautiful Rivers is focusing on India's problem, it's really focusing at the world's problems. We're interconnected here. It's choosing to stare at the worst fates our current economic system is producing and trying to make sense of a few case studies. As you already pointed out, John, I think this book gives a lot more complexity to this whole idea of what poverty looks like. There are too many of us in the West who think that poverty means not having an Xbox One. This book definitely shows what other forms of poverty look like, what absolute poverty actually looks like, and the gradations even within that category. Second observation, the writing style. There's something that bothers me about the writing style. She says that she's speaking for the characters, but she heightens their perspective with her florid prose and her professional experience, so it's no longer their word. It's almost like an omniscient third person fly on the wall with a penchant for poetry. I really wish that she would have employed a more subjective viewpoint at certain points throughout the book, because it's impossible for us as humans not to put our opinions into something. I could be jumping to a conclusion here. I'm just talking about those first four chapters. What I see in those first four chapters is just a little too much opinion stated as a fact and working its way into what is supposed to be third person omniscient description. She's playing God here and that leads me to my third point. Western journalistic impatience. India is a nation of over 1500 dialects and roughly the same number of specific ethnicities and is home to an ebb and flow of crisscrossing cultural histories and civilizations extending back thousands of years into the past. But for well over 250 years, India has had white people coming in, putting our hands on our hips, sizing up the situation and saying, yep, I pretty much got this figured out. Waving away thousands of years of context with a flick of a wrist after just a few years and a mediocre grasp of one of the 1500 languages. Now for the most part, Boo does a better job than probably 95% of Westerns who've come into India to take stock of social ills. My favorite book about urban poverty was this book, The Corner, A Year in the Life of an Inner City Neighborhood by David Simon and Ed Burns. The Wire was based on this book. David Simon and Ed Burns wrote this book after decades, decades each, of living in, working among, and reporting about the people and subjects in this book. And not only are they good students of the specific cultural situation they're walking into, it is their home culture. But Catherine Boo has spent four years in a country not her own, a socioeconomic reality not her own, and a bevy of cultures and languages not her own. She's not a third person omniscient narrator, she is a cultural four-year-old. And for too long, four-year-olds have been coming into India and assessing India's pros and cons from behind magic journalistic objectivity cloaks that spontaneously grant removal of bias and omniscient third-person viewpoint. This takes time to master, and this book, in my opinion, hasn't had enough of it. I still think it's a good book. I think it's a stepping stone in the right direction. And I do look forward to reading the rest, and maybe some of my frustrations that I've expressed about these first four chapters change as the book goes on. Indian viewers, what do you think? Thanks, John and Hank. Many congrats on The Fault in Our Stars' success, and all the best on VidCon. Until next time, YouTube, keep it creative, keep it cross-cultural, and keep it constructive. Thank you very much.